that awkward moment where everyone's looking at themselves. <clears throat> all right, I think uh, I think it's all all live and ready to go. So uh, welcome to our, our conversation, uh, how to do a conversational dojo uh, with a focus on building conversational skills. I'm Jeff Frederick. And I'm Doug Squirrel, and most people call me Squirrel. So Jeffrey probably will. Yep. I, I, I'm, I may have called you Douglas at some point in the past, but it was probably because I was just humoring whoever was with us. A long time ago. That's right. Uh, and uh, we're the authors of the recently published Agile Conversations, which right. I imagine most of you are aware of. Um, and uh, this webinar is something we're doing in, in part by um, popular demand. Uh, we've had several people uh, tell us that they were going to be doing practice sessions and wanted tips and tricks for how to run it. And uh, that was music to our ears because we think that's a very effective way to learn the skills from the book. But before we get started into the webinar, uh, we're going to be practicing something we'll preach. We'll come back to this later. So we were talking earlier about the difference between the chat window and the Q&A widget. And hopefully you've been able to find them and that they're separate. So in the chat window, we're gonna ask you a question. So when you ask us a question, you ask it in the Q&A widget. When we ask you a question, you answer in the chat window. So I hope everybody window, can follow that. It is Monday, but we hope you've had a chance to have some coffee. <laughs> so for in the chat window, uh, we'd like to know, what do you hope to get out of the session? What would make it a 10 for you? So if you can just take a, a quick second and uh, we're gonna be monitoring the chat and hopefully see all the answers just stream on past. So. Uh, we have our first answer, uh, the, and the, the first winner is uh, Andrew, so which is fantastic. So uh, we know that people, uh, uh, now we have our second, so we know some people who actually are uh, looking to get stuff. So things you can start putting in practice tomorrow, fantastic, we can definitely do that. Uh, what a good conversational dojo looks like, very good. Um, practical tips about teaching and implementing, fantastic. Uh, Someone says they're looking for the recording. Okay. <laughs> well, there will, there will be a recording. There will be a recording uh, and uh, a, a link to download the toolkit afterwards. So uh, we'll be talking about the toolkit and then you'll have it to download. Um, some fun things to do with my team. Okay, good. Experience and first steps. Fantastic tips and I can use immediately. So that's great. So what we're going to cover today is um, stuff that's um, come out of I want to get this right. I think, uh, Squirrel, you and I started first uh, practicing with our own uh, dojo group in, uh, I remember it was 2012. So yep, we're talking that about- was, uh, That's my memory years. too. Yep. And then, and then I formed uh, a, a public meetup at the time called the Action Science Meetup. Uh, for people who look through, or not just the book, but through the, the footnotes, we'll find that uh, we reference a, a school of uh, conversational background called Action Science. So this is the Action Science Meetup. I think I started that in 2013. Yep. Um, so I've Sounds been doing it for right. uh, uh, seven years publicly. And before that, I was doing it internally within the uh, company uh, that I was at at the time. So I've been doing this mix of public and private uh, for, um, for, for, uh, for seven years, hosting people who were unfamiliar with the material. And I, and I highlight that because what we're going to talk about is um, how to transition people from, uh, from knowing really nothing about what we're talking about through to being uh, uh, really at fairly advanced practitioners. And uh, because it is a uh, progression and uh, we wanna help you get started on that uh, and, uh, and how to continue on it successfully. So here's our agenda for today, um, talk, talking about why you'd wanna do this at all. Then we'll get really into the nitty gritty of the types of, of sessions, some, some hands-on tips that, that uh, I know that some of you are waiting for, and then uh, how to use the Dojo Kit itself. I'll mention, by the way, the Dojo Kit itself will cover uh, all of these topics. So there's a bit in there uh, written about why to form a conversational dojo with the idea that you would, might share that with other people who weren't able to see the webinar. And, and similarly, we cover the types of dojo sessions we have as tips and tricks that are actually more than we're gonna cover today because we get into some of the differences between in-person sessions and virtual sessions. Um, we don't cover how to use the, the dojo kit. That's not in there, you just kind of figure it out. Actually, there's a run book, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that when we get there. Uh, so with that, uh, like um, yeah, dojos. Can I, can, I, can I butt in with a, with, with a question? Absolutely. Actually, so, so, so I just wanted to illustrate that if people have questions, there's a Q&A widget that they can use. <laughs> and we like it when they interrupt with questions as I'm just modeling right now. So I'm going to ask a question. 
Yeah. Course, you couldn't talk like this, but you have a Q&A widget, so please go ahead and use that. If you use the chat, there might be too many things going by in there, so we might miss it. So put your question in the Q&A widget, put your chat and comments uh, in, the, in the chat, and we'll ask you to, to do various things at some moments, and you'll write that in the chat. But if you separate those two uh, questions that come in, for instance, we've just had one from Ann and Shul. Thank you very much for, for helping out, Ann Shul, um, to answer this question, uh, how long is this session? It will be 45 minutes to an hour, um, and maybe a bit longer depending on your questions, but the main content should be about 45 minutes. So that's great. We, we like being interrupted. We're Im improv folks. We're kind of a double act. So um, please <laughs> bring in your questions. We're happy to stop and, and uh, address them if they match what we're talking about. If not, we'll, we'll have some time to, to stop at the end and take up questions. And the question I wanted to ask is Jeffrey I actually we didn't figure this out ahead of time are we going to tell people what a dojo is like what the original <laughs> word dojo means sure absolutely and I and I think uh, this is the perfect slide to bring it up so um uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll mention by the way scroll I want to don't want to forget this you're going to be the voice of the audience uh, interrupting with the Q&A since um, I have the slides in full screen that makes uh, sense it'll be easier for you to do that um and, and uh, uh um dojo have you been to a dojo before scroll uh, I have been not to a, a real world one, not to a karate or, or um, uh -huh. uh, um, uh, uh, martial arts dojo. I've seen them, but I've not actually been to one. Yeah. Uh, but you've been to a uh, coding dojo, maybe? Uh, and then... Coding dojo. I know I've heard about them, but I'm not actually sure I've ever been to one. Okay. So, it might have been uh, a long time ago. My coding days are a long way in the past. <laughs> So I, I have experience with real world dojos in sort of the, the uh, martial arts sense. Um, um, did judo as a kid and then um, with my own children have done various martial arts. So a dojo comes out of this, you'd be placed, it's, um, it's uh, it, I actually looked it up as you do when you're going to do web arts. It's, it's something like the place of the way. It comes out apparently out of um, a Zen. And so it wasn't just a place where you do martial arts. It'd be a place where you go to practice uh, uh, the, the way, the, the thing. And so it's setting up a, a time and place to practice. One of the things that we emphasize again and again in the book is that practice is really required. And, and that's actually a question I want to ask the audience now. And again, this is a chance for your chat widget. Uh, uh, in the chat answer, have you done any individual practice? Meaning, have you at some point um, taken a piece of paper, folded it in half, and done a conversation analysis? So, um, and of course, you, some of you might not know what that is. Don't worry, you'll find out as, as we go through this. We're using um, concepts from Agile Conversations. We're assuming some of you have read that. And yeah. if you've read it, you might have done some of the practice. If you haven't, don't worry, because you'll have a chance to do the practice here. Right. And so, so practice that you've done, and importantly here, outside of your head. Uh, uh, not, if you, and if you, maybe you've done it in another way, maybe talking with people, you've pr talked through things, that would qualify. Anything outside of your head, um, but just thinking, something beyond just thinking about it. If you have, answer in the, in the chat. I'd be curious to see how many people have, have done that. And we, we have a couple people who are asking, what is the action? What is the thing that you, don't worry again, because we'll, we'll explain it. But if, okay. you haven't read the, if you haven't read the book or, or aren't familiar with this idea, we're not expecting you to know. What you do is you take a piece of paper that looks like this. I'm trying to do a piece of paper with my hands. You fold it in half. That gives you two columns. And on the right-hand side, you write uh, what uh, each individual person said. And Jeffrey has a beautiful example, which is much better than my hands. And on the left-hand <laughs> side, you write what you thought and felt. We'll right. say a lot more about that, but that's the activity. If that's not familiar, don't worry, because that's what a dojo is about, to learn about that topic and how to do it. And we'll be both illustrating how to do it and also telling you how to run a session in which you help other people to do it. And, and so the, the, uh, you'll see three colors of ink in here and they have to do with the recording of the conversation, the reflecting and the, the revision. Now, and you will, there's also an example that is in the dojo kit and actually we'll cover in the slides later. So Fantastic. if you're not quite uh, clear about the elements of practice, we will get into that. But we'll start with- a couple, couple things to pick up from the, from the chat. The first is that someone says, um, uh, did a left-hand case, which is another kind of name for this, um, via Roger Schwartz uh, and his mutual learning approach. So that's something we're big fans of and so glad to hear about that. Um, we also have a challenging question. We have an anonymous person who has said that uh, the term dojo is offensive. And uh, that's not something I was aware of. I'd be happy to hear more about it. We're not gonna have a discussion about that here. Um, but if you'd like to get in touch with us, um, you can find us on conversation transformation.com willing to change the name we didn't know about that so uh, happy to hear about it if we're doing something that we shouldn't yep um, so uh, uh, 
I'll be curious. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very keen to hear about that. The, uh, um, the, the idea of a, of a, of this is a place where we're going to go and, and practice. So in, uh, the person who described, uh, doing it from, uh, Roger Schwartz, that's actually where we started. We were starting, uh, when we had a, a practice group, it was, um, focused, uh, at when I ran them internally and the first externally, we were, um, using some of his material from his, uh, eight behaviors for smarter teams, um, white paper, uh, uh, so one of the things we'll talk about here is we're talking about the format for conversational practice. And in particular, why is it important to uh, have a, a regular practice session in the real world? The, uh, the One of the elements here is just skill development goes faster with deliberate practice. And I think that a lot of people understand this uh, when it comes to uh, other types of skills. You know that if you want to build muscles, then you want to go to the gym. And if you want to um, have persistent uh, uh, advantages, that you need to keep up your practice. Um, for some reason, uh, I, and, I, and I know why this is, um, people often have the perception that they, that they don't need to do this when it comes to conversational techniques. There's an illusion that uh, just understanding is enough. And, and a bit of the reason for that is because we don't uh, have the same real world feedback in conversations that we get, say, um, if you're trying to lift a weight. You, you, you don't go to the gym and try to lift a weight and fail to lift it and think that you lifted it. There's, 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 there's immediate feedback. You, you, you don't go out to try to um, snow ski and fall down and think that you made it down the hill without falling. So the, the real world real world skills tend to give you uh, feedback that is unambiguous. And when people are able to practice and get rapid unambiguous feedback is when skills develop quickly. And this is not, uh, this is just the, you can look up about uh, deliberate practice and skill acquisition. And this is what the, the literature says on it. Uh, the problem with conversations is that we don't get feedback. So, uh, and, and that's why group practice is more effective. So the, um, the challenge is that the kind of cognitive biases that are the, uh, where our problems in conversations originate, um, not only cause us to make mistakes in the first place, but also prevents us from seeing the feedback. And I, I brought in one of the tools here, which is the ladder of inference over on the right. And you'll see, uh, for people who aren't familiar, that the ladder of inference is a mental model that kind of says, how when we get stimulus in the world, that's the data that's outside of our head, it, we instantly you know, go up this ladder uh, um, to beliefs that we then take actions. So in a conversation, the uh, external data is someone saying something. And uh, the other action at the top of our, outside of our head is responding. That uh, ladder of inference happens instantaneously and we're often unaware of the different levels. And the, the, you see that there's this reflexive loop that goes from our beliefs about the world change the data that we observe. It doesn't change the real world. <laughs> the real world is pretty persistent that way. But it changes what we observe, and so therefore what we uh, uh, think the real world is, uh, is like. And, and this is an example of how our cognitive biases uh, it will impact our conversations. But the, the cognitive bias that causes that sort of selection bias also makes you unaware that you're making selection bias. So this is, this is the challenge. Now, the good news is in a group, uh, we, are, we don't have the same problem uh, because what we have as humans this uh, fantastic ability to spot problems in other people. We're, we're not very good at spotting them in ourselves, but we can instantly spot it in, in others. And the advantage of the group is that you have all those other people acting as eyes, giving you feedback. And so we set up the idea when we're doing a conversational dojo, if we set up a space saying, we're, we're setting up this time and place where we've agreed that we want to uh, get, do this kind of practice together. And, uh, and therefore I'm inviting feedback of this kind from people who also care about it. And hopefully that makes us more receptive to feedback that uh, in another context, we would be less open, less able to hear. So we, we, we've, we've kind of done some selection bias ourselves in getting together a group of people and trying to make a space where we are going to 
be making mistakes. And, and this, is, this is really key. We're going to be making mistakes because learning here comes from making mistakes and then correcting them. Um, and, and I just mentioned here also that uh, in addition to being more effective, practicing with other people is a lot more fun. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's good when, when you have one sort of forehead pounding moments, oh, how could I have done that? To have other people there to share that moment of, of learning with you. It can anything? be pretty painful. Absolutely. Yeah. I was just going to uh, tell tell a couple of uh, tales from from our dojo because the very first one that we had, which we didn't call by this name, by the way, we just called it the meetup of a few folks learning about this topic. <laughs> I, I don't know if we had any fancy name. I, I called it like organizational learning or something like that. Um, but uh, what we would do is uh, get together uh, every couple of weeks, um, and one person we got together with is is the person who brought these ideas to Jeffrey and me, uh, a guy named Benjamin. And uh, one of the stories he would tell us, one of the great things you get from this uh, shared work on conversations is great stories. And uh, what he said was uh, that when he had first been learning this technique, he would actually make physical tape recordings of his conversations. We're only asking you to write it on a piece of paper. He went further and he'd make a tape recording with the person's permission, of course. And then he would play them back to himself. And when he played them back, he would uh, shout at the tape recorder because he would hear himself doing something wrong. And he would shout, Benjamin, remember his name is Benjamin, so he's shouting at himself in the tape record. Benjamin, stop doing that. You shouldn't do that. That's not the way to do it. So that self-distancing where he was able to look at himself was helpful. It was even more helpful, we found, to get together with a group, to be looking at the analysis on a piece of paper, again, distanced from yourself, and it could also be shared then with the other folks in the room. So that's why we strongly encourage you, uh, if you're going to do this, to, to practice by folding that piece of paper in half, writing the conversational analysis. We'll be saying more about that. Um, I know we had a couple of questions come in. Anything that you would like to address at, the, at this time? Uh, do we have any more? Um, we have a couple more comments on the, the topic of the word dojo, but we're very interested in that. We are going to read about that. We're not going to do that in this session because we want to focus on the topic uh, of conversations. So uh, thanks for those. We will read those. Um, uh, let's see. And I don't think we actually have any other questions that we need to answer. Uh, someone's asked how many different companies are represented. Uh, we won't take a poll on that, but I think there are lots. Uh, there are 153 of you, so there must be a good number of, of companies. And uh, they change order, which is slightly confusing. Uh, someone just has praise for us. As we, uh, he, he, I think, Drew likes our, our treatment of this uh, model and using it for conversations. So use, useful to know. Uh, so no, no questions right at the moment. Okay. One, one thing I'll mention, and, and we, this slide was really about the advantages of doing a dojo from sort of a skill perspective. Some people might also find it um, helpful as a commitment perspective. It's the kind of thing where you know doing the analysis and know doing the work and know doing the practice would be helpful. Um, but somehow it's very hard to find the time to actually do it until you get to the room where you've all agreed you're going to do it. And guess what? Now we're doing it. So <laughs> certainly uh, that's another element. It's not directly about how the, the difference makes having the skill, but it certainly is a factor for some people that uh, help with the follow through. Um, so uh, happy to get any more questions about the benefits of dojos. Uh, we, 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 did, we did get one more, one more, sorry, just came in. Um, this self-distancing Soren, Surin, I'm not sure how to say it. Self-distancing reminds me of how supervision in social professions works. Um, we actually have a mutual friend who is a, um, uh, uh, an amateur anthropologist. So I imagine he might've been doing some of that self-analysis. Yep. Uh, and, and I think here we're saying that the uh, self-distancing uh, that we usually talk about is about getting it on your head on the page. And then I think you're right, having the other people in the session and having that group conversation uh, uh, does really um, uh, give you that, that sort of uh, um, collective feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think there's a, there's a lot to that. Um, uh, one thing to, that I think can, um, when we get into tips, will be uh, the, that um, trying to make sure that you have everyone contributing to the feedback not just um, the, the one sort of supervisor. That's something to, to be careful of. I'm not sure how that uh, works with the sort of social professions. Um, we have a couple of questions that I think are relevant to what we're, we're just talking about here. Some, some others we're going to ignore. That doesn't mean we're not going to deal with them. It's just that they're coming later. Um, and we have more one, questions, uh, more Q&A later as well. Or Q&A later. So if we're not answering your question, we're not ignoring it. It just means it's going to fit someplace else, we think. Um, Glenn asks, is this likely to make people less inclined to contribute to conversations due to worrying about what they will say? So to clarify, the people in the room 
may not be the people who are having the conversation that you're talking about, um, which is another reason to have it be trusted folks, a safe space, um, people that you know, um, who uh, will not go and blab the conversation necessarily to someone else. You don't also, you can also anonymize the conversation so that they don't know uh, who the other person is. That's a very common thing to do. Um, so it, it's very powerful. And I've done this a couple of times with Jeffrey and with others in that group that we worked in uh, to have a conversation between the two people in the room, because then you have access to the thoughts of both people. And you can say, yeah, well, when you said this, I didn't think that's what you meant. I thought this, and it's very, very valuable. But the typical situation is you bring a conversation that you had with somebody else. So I might have a conversation. I'll pick on Alex because he's on my screen. Um, have a conversation with Alex. Um, we'll have a disagreement about something. It might not go so well about uh, how to promote the book. And I'll come to Jeffrey and I'll say, Jeffrey, here's my case. Here's what I wrote. Um, here's the scoring. Um, what do you think about that? And that's what we're going to be describing here. So uh, excellent question. Um, but uh, typically, you won't have the situation where the people in the room are the ones who are having the conversation. Therefore, they won't be uh, particularly concerned. Um, and most times, most people that I've told that I do this um, aren't, aren't suddenly clamming up and saying, I don't want to talk to you, Squirrel, because you might tell some other people. They know that I would anonymize and um, that I'm trying to learn to have a better conversation. So that's not one that we see very often. I, I think you, 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 to me, Squirrel, I think you, you had a good answer, but I think you buried the lead. Oh, sorry. You, uh, can you unbury it for me, please? Y yeah. Because uh, 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 which is the almost last thing you said was um, they know I'm trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So uh, the um, the essence of this is that when you go to do a, a conversation analysis, you, uh, you're looking to improve your conversational skills. It's not about the other person. You you are trying to work on your own skills. So my experience about this is when people say, "Well, why are you, why are you doing this?" It's to say, "Well, because." I want to be better. I feel like I could improve my skills and we would have more productive conversations. That's why I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've taken this conversation and I've discussed it. Um, and this, this could actually be a, a, an entry into a follow-up conversation. You, you, you know, Roger, uh, we, we had that conflict last week and I, and I spent some time, I went and did some analysis on it and tried to think about what I might do. And, I, and on reflection, I, I really can see I, I, I made some mistakes and I, like, I don't think I listened to you often enough. I, 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 went, I went back and now I realize I really didn't understand what you were about. Can, would you be willing to explain to me what you were thinking you know, as an example? Mm -hmm. The idea that, that you're going to try to improve your skills for your conversation so that you can understand someone better is something that I think people generally will welcome <laughs> rather than find threatening. And, and that's the key is that you're, you're doing this to focus on yourself, n not to, to you know, the other party. Um, so I'd be curious if we get more, but uh, as I said, we'll have plenty of time for questions we go through. Don't, don't save them up. Just put them in and we'll try to work them in. And, and anything, we, we're, we're happy. We, anything we don't get, get to as we go through, we have a, a final uh, question slide. Um, now, uh, as I said, I've been doing many uh, different sessions for, for, for many years, and I, and I have found that they fall into a few different formats. And so to simplify it, I've kind of distilled it down to three sessions. Uh, three types of sessions. Uh, the, and, and these are like a foundational session, which is where you are learning the very basics of conversation analysis and the most basic skill. Now, for people who've read the book, this would be what we cover in chapter two. This is about transparency and curiosity. And for people who haven't read it, don't worry. This is the example of the kind of scoring that we have in the kit, and we'll discuss a bit more later. So you, you, this is where I found this very good for uh, beginners, uh, the first timers, um, if I have a high proportion of people coming to the London Organizational Learning Meetup, uh, which is what the Action Science Art became, uh, then uh, we will typically do a foundation session. Like, let's, let's make sure we have this common idea about transparency and curiosity as fundamental. Uh, it, one of the elements about this is that, that no one uh, that I've come across really disagrees with this. It, it, we, we usually put it another way. We say, if you're going to make a decision as a group, um, how would you go about it? And people always say, well, we want to hear, you know, what everyone thinks, what they know. And I'm like, would you share you, what you know? Absolutely. So you're transparent about what you know and what you, what you think, what you believe. And you're curious about what everyone else knows and what they think and what they believe. And when you have all the information out there, then you have the most information to make a good decision. So that's the basic conversational unit right there. It, in a workplace is typically, we're trying to make a decision and how are we gonna go about it in the most productive way? Everyone knows that it's transparency and curiosity. What you the find- problem is find, actually doing it. Exactly, what you find out, if you do the work, if you do the conversation analysis, you find out, actually, that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not being transparent as transparent as I could be, and I'm not being 
curious. And, and people don't believe this. They don't understand it until they do the work. And, uh, and that's why uh, these uh, sessions are so important. And so if you're sitting there saying to yourself, well, that's good because I really need to help all these other people be transparent and curious. Good news that I'm transparent and curious. I'm really good <laughs> at doing this. If you believe that, please uh, write down a couple of lines of a, uh, of a conversation and follow along with us when we, uh, when we do the, uh, the analysis later in the scoring. And I predict you will discover that you're not as transparent and curious as you thought you were. And that is a painful recollection, painful realization, but also the uh, beginning of very useful learning. Um, after this foundation session, we, we, people are, want to learn different tools and different techniques. So the fundamentals of our practice are, are the four R's, which are, you know, record, uh, reflect, revise, and role play. Uh, and they can be applied to many different conversational tools and many different conversational frameworks. Not just what we cover in Agile Conversations, but, but many more. And so we've done uh, sessions on things like um, Leap Method from Xavier Amador. Um, I did one on Thursday we, uh, at the London Organizational Learning Meetup. We did it on nonviolent communication. And in particular, for you will know that, the, the section on, on making requests. So just that one skill from the four part NVC model, we had a session all about that one skill. Um, the the, the, the uh, ladder of inference we had earlier, that's a tool that you might have a session focused just on that. And, and these are uh, uh, particular sessions where, where the goal is to, to learn about that tool and to essentially each tool allows you to see your conversation from a slightly different angle through a slightly different lens and brings up different thoughts. That, so they generate different insights. So in my experience, it's been very helpful to have a wide range of tools available uh, and to, to try uh, practicing with different ones. Because what we're trying to do is build up a, a toolkit uh, build up a skill set of a bunch of different conversational skills so that when it comes to real life, you have more options. And then the kind of the most, the deepest uh, session comes to what we're calling a full case session. And this is where the focus is not on a particular tool, but really going in depth on a conversation. And there's a couple different ways to structure this. It could be that everyone has brought a case and everyone's working to the case and maybe they pair up or just one person's case is the focus at a time, and maybe you go through a couple over the course of the session. So you have different options about how, among your group, how you want to divide it up. Um, uh, I've often had it where, say, on a lunch hour, we might get one through one or two. Uh, so that might be a way that we've done this uh, in the past. So give you a sense of the kind of time it might take. This is where someone has already done work ahead of time. They've already written up the case. They've already done their scoring. They may have already done their revision and they're bringing that, and then now the group will provide feedback on it. Now you might think, well, if I've already done all the work, why am I bothering to bring it to a discussion session? And, and that's where the idea of all those, the value of those extra eyes. I remember very distinctly uh, in one of our sessions, Squirrel, where I brought a case, and I started by saying, well, I don't think there's very much here. I think I did pretty well in this conversation. And we were still discussing it 90 minutes later. And yep. uh, 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 to say, you know, <laughs> it didn't take very long into that discussion of my analysis that I had a very different view of my conversation, of my skills, and my insight in analyzing it than I did at the start. Uh, and again, th these things often feel difficult. They, they, uh, people might have heard us use the phrase before, learning is horrible, which is a, a very divisive phrase. It sounds like some people really don't like that. But it, to be clear, we, we need a very particular type of insight. And I, I just started reading a book uh, called Thanks for the Feedback. And, it, and it, it perfectly captures this in something they called an identity trigger, which is when you find learn something that challenges your identity, it can be very threatening. And that's the type of insight that you might get in a full case session. And so it's very helpful to have people there who can help you see your blind spots. Although the, the downside is you might uh, find out that you're not as uh, skillful, you're, you're not necessarily the person you thought you were in the conversation as you were coming in. So these are the three types of sessions and why you might do it. For people who followed um, Aikido, uh, uh, you might be familiar with the phrase Shu Ha Ri, or if you follow Alistair Coburn, he's written about this a lot in, in Agile. And the idea is a, a beginner level Shu, you're just sort of doing what you're told. At the Ha level, you're uh, learning a range of techniques. And then at Ri level, you're sort of uh, transcendent. I wouldn't say these don't exactly uh, match uh, to it, but they, they, there is kind of a path through here. Uh, that, that connect them 
so in the end, you you do end up where you would be spending your time um, up mostly applying all the techniques that you've learned in these full case sessions. We have a bunch of uh, interesting questions, some of which I think we'll get to later, but I'm going to butt in with a couple here, Jeffrey, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. Um, they, then they scroll up quickly, which is great. You guys are asking lots of questions. Please keep them coming. It just and I think sense. they also they vote them, right? There's, there's, I think there's like a vote order. Oh, maybe that's why they jump around because somebody's yeah. voting for them. Oh, that's right. okay. I did not know that. Learning all kinds of stuff. Um, so someone asks, can, some, can these skills help me resolve arguments in my condo um, uh, homeowners association? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, <laughs> yes, it's the brief answer. Um, you might enjoy a book called Difficult Conversations, which um, in addition to our book, um, uh, covers more things that are outside the workplace. So um, uh, the brief answer is yes. Um, there's a whole uh, host of them that, um, uh, that can do that. Uh, I'll say at one of our internal sessions, I described these lunchtime sessions, we, we didn't limit them to work conversations. And we did have a very um, long, we, we, had, we had ones about builders came up more than once uh, uh, and, uh, and also neighbors. So uh, definitely these, these, uh, these skills and these practice sessions, there's, I have never limited them to a particular type of conversation. And when people come to the London Organizational Learning Meetup, we don't, we don't put any limits on the type of case. We just describe the tools, ask people about a conversation when they're frustrated, and we get, we get all kinds. You absolutely do. Uh, let's see, a couple of other things. So someone wants to know about the recording, if uh, Alex or um, uh, Leah could just stick in a little more about the uh, recording in the chat. This person was a bit late, but there, there will be a recording after. Um, uh, uh, let's see, so we'll cover that one later. Sorry, they are jumping around. That's the only thing that's challenging here. Um, are these sessions outlined in the book? Uh, we talk a bit about how to do this, but not in this depth. So this is new material that's not in the book. Uh, so um, uh, it's certainly available to download afterwards. Uh, so you can read our very short um, uh, text on how to What do we this. talk about in the book, it focuses on how to use the tools. So we would yes. focus on kind of the reflect and revise step. So that's the focus of the tool. So we're, we are teaching what you would use in the session, but we don't describe the sessions themselves. We, exactly. we do say, yep. you know, we do, we do recommend, you know, form a study group, but we don't tell you how to do it. And that was one of the reasons that really led to us uh, creating this webinar and, and the kit, because people said, look, that's not in your book. You tell us you to do us. it, but you don't tell yeah. us how. <laughs> exactly. Tell us how. So here we we're are. Like, um, okay. Yeah, we sure will. Um, and an anonymous person says, are there virtual groups that provide a safe space to practice these skills? I think the London Organizational Learning Meetup, which you have to rename, Jeffrey, because it is yeah. virtual now. The virtual, I yeah. <laughs> uh, just renamed it, the Virtual Organizational Learning Meetup uh, does in fact do that. So if you search for London uh, Organizational Learning Meetup, you should find it. If not, ask us on uh, uh, conversationaltransformation.com, uh, which is where you can find both of us. And, and my, my hope is for us to start keeping track of other people who are doing this. So if you intend to do a public meeting, up to get in touch with us because my intention is to keep a registry of that so people can find each other worldwide. So, or if you're interested in one, get in contact with us and we'll, we'll put you on a list so when there's someone in your area, uh, we can try to um, uh, help, help one form. Absolutely. All right, if that's it for questions. Oh, that is it on the questions the I format. think for now. For now. Then let's, let's, get into, let's get into Dojo Tips. Um, and I think there are, like I said, there are more tips and we could spend a lot of time on, on just the tips, but I wanted to keep it down to a manageable list um, with what I consider as being um, the, the, the key insights and, and the, the most important elements. Um, and the first one is going to be this, that the, 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 the judges are a place for learning through practice. And I want to focus this, the goal is practice. People should be practicing uh, while they're in there, practicing the skills. Um, now, this is worth highlighting because there's a real temptation, at least for me, and I think I've seen this with others as well, that the theory is so interesting. It can so, be so interesting to talk about the tools themselves rather than applying the tools. Like the, the ladder of interesting, the ladder of insight, uh, ladder of inference, ah, is such an, I find it such a fascinating cognitive concept and explains so much. I have had many conversations about it and what it means and, and you know, how accurate is the model, you know, other cognitive biases that might be going on. Great, wonderful dumb, just, uh, conversations, but they're not practicing conversational analysis. This is the biggest challenge I've seen. It. I think it's the biggest mistake that I made when I first tried to bring these kind of practice sessions to other people. I used to start with a lot of theory, like, okay, we're gonna be doing this and let's go explain like why this is all relevant. What I learned over, that was just wasted time. That the, the best way 
for people to really get it is to start doing it. So it was a little bit like I was going to do a piano lesson and I gave the theory and history of pianos. How long before the strings we, are and how the hammers yeah, hit them. Exactly. And, yeah. Before, before like, you know, like, no, go push, <laughs> push this. Dunk, 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 that dunk, sound dunk, you're making. Sticks. Yeah, this, this is what it is. You know, you know get, get your hands on the keyboards. And so that's the, 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 the biggest issue. Now there's a, a couple elements that come, uh, that come up uh, along with this. One is going to be the people who resist a bit doing the practice. Now, first of all, no one needs to do the practice they don't want to. But a lot of times people create a larger barrier for themselves than, than is really helpful. Uh, the most common ones will be something like this. Oh, I didn't create a case. Uh, um, uh, I see other people brought one. I, I forgot to, I didn't bring one. Um, it doesn't take very long to create a case. Squirrel, would you be prepared to demonstrate? Um, do you have a piece of paper? Certainly do. I'm just getting that out right now. Sorry, okay. I didn't remember to do it beforehand. I'm not prepared, but I'm actually demonstrating to you how, how quickly you can get prepared and uh, take the steps. I'm pulling up a piece of paper out of my printer right now. Now, see, one of the things that makes this work is that the other objections people will have is things like, I don't remember the whole conversation. Or I can't remember the words exactly. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I just, I really don't remember the words that were said. And uh, there's, a, there's a funny trick here which is it doesn't, all that doesn't really matter. Uh, my uh, claim is that the, uh, the cognitive biases that, that generate your, your errors, they also, they work on your memory and they work on your imagination. <laughs> so if, if I say, Squirrel, can you think of a conversation where you were frustrated? And if you just write a couple lines, just say, you know, they said and I said, to capture the dialogue on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, put what you were thinking while they said what they said and you know, while you said what you said. That's it, so really we're talking about two lines of dialogue with, with the corresponding thoughts. And with that, we have a case. Now, uh, there's one other tip here. If someone says, nope, you know, I'm just thinking about it. I can't remember a conversation where I was frustrated. Now, that would be very surprising. Then you have a, my, my current ultimate fallback is say, fantastic, can you go ahead and write a case about our conversation right now about not having a case? because they can't say that that conversation didn't happen because you just had it. <laughs> so write those down and now write what you were thinking during this conversation. That, that's it, you, you have the material. It's the, the lack of material is not a problem. There's an abundance of material and it, it doesn't take very long to write them down. Um, in fact, I've already finished writing a case in the time that you just listened to me do that. So all right. Now written a case right here, which we can use as an example. Right. I'm not very and, good at my folding skills, but the rest is just fine. <laughs> and and, and the, the, the case that I held up earlier from, from this is from Thursday night, um, we created that, I, I wrote that in five minutes. Um, so that was a bit longer. I, I uh, might, might've been three actually, I can't remember. I think I gave three minutes and then another two minutes for people who were still writing. Um, you see, it's not a large piece of paper. It's not exhaustive. It was, there was still plenty of insight in it. Mine so is the, two lines. Um, Stijin <laughs> says, so the main message to take away from this session is just do it. I don't know if that's the only message, but certainly um, get an actual piece of paper, fold it in it's, half, write stuff on it. You will be farther ahead than you were before. And, and, and yes, and yes, that is the major message is, is do it. Get a group of people because that, that sort of commitment device helps people um, and, uh, and show up and all get in the room together because you're much more likely to, to get it done with, with more people. So yes, do it, get the group you know, get the band together and, uh, and, and, and make some music, go, go do it. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, it's gonna leads into the, the next one. Uh, everyone speaks. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, and there's a couple elements to this. Um, the most important one, if I tie it back to the practice, is it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, when I run the meetup, and I, even though I've been doing this for many years, I make sure that when we're discussing some element, someone's case or some piece of a case, that I'm not the only one who's talking. It's not a one, it's not a, it's not a series of one-way conversations. It's when everyone else can think they see a problem that the other person's having and try to correct, try to help them. Say, look, wait, I'm seeing this. Have you thought about that? Have you tried this? What if you did that? It's, it's that helping of each other, that's practice. It, that's really, really valuable practice. And, it's, and, be, and it's especially because remember, it's easier to see the mistakes with other people than with yourself. So if you're in a room with seven people 
you have six really good opportunities to practice those skills and one not so good one, which is yourself. <laughs> the, the chance to practice with the other people are, are, are where you're going to actually get some of your best practice because you can see clearer than you can see in your own case. So it's self distancing again, to do that. hard at work. Um, the, the other thing here about everyone speaks is, is to, to try to help make that happen. There's, there's a, a couple uh, uh, ways to do this. Uh, first of all, is to, it helps to prime everyone earlier. Now you recall, we started this by saying, what do you hope to get out of the session? There, there can be many type of check-in style questions. That's just one. Um, but the idea is to go around the room and have everyone speak at least once. This is, this is generally good meeting hygiene. It, for people who do have, have studied sort of meeting facilitation, you may know that if everyone, anyone who's spoken up once in a meeting is more likely to speak up later. And people who remain silent at the beginning are more likely to remain silent throughout. So we want the advantage of speaking, it helps to prime them. And then it also helps to facilitate that in a way. So it's very common uh, for me to go and uh, go around the room. And I will do this for you know reasonably large groups because you can go fairly quickly. You can go around and say, all right, you've all written this down. I'm gonna go around and just, you know, I'm gonna point to you and if you have any, any sort of aha moments, you, you know, share them now and we'll go around. Certainly for small groups, for anything under 10, absolutely this, you know, go around any aha moments from this. There, even the act of writing the case down is a chance for people to say, oh my gosh, like now that I wrote it down and see it, I, I, I can't believe I did this. So this, so you have a chance to go around the room uh, when you write the case. Uh, so record, you have a chance to uh, aha moments. Uh, when you go ahead and do the reflect and do your scoring, another chance for aha moments. I like to go around the room the other direction uh, after you revise again, and it, of course again at the at the end of session. So there's multiple chances here, and and that's at every chance to speak and and for insight and for asking questions, all opportunities for practice. We have that a relevant is... we have a relevant question that came up earlier that I, I think we Fantastic. might want to answer it now. Um, it's from Joseph, and he asks, uh, "What size of a group is common for successful dojos on conversations? Size of an agile team?" So you were just referring to a smaller group yeah. might be easier to go round. Um, what's what's the record? How many how many have you done? I, I oh. haven't done very big ones, so I've, oh, I've, I I've done, done I've done I've done a practice session uh, with a hundred people. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I and I went around the room. <laughs> uh, um, I didn't go around the room a, a lot of times, uh, but I did go around twice. It was a it was a longer session. It was part of a a, a training for a, a large group of um, consultants, and so mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we we were, were having people work through a case, uh, uh, and we did go around um, uh, uh, twice on for aha moments on the material. There was probably a third time earlier. Um, right. I also I it, might suggest it, that you're going to have an easier time if you're new to this to start with yeah. a smaller group. I might not start with the 100 people. No, don't don't start with 100. I'll just say that there's in, there's many ways like like Squirrel's case, which was just two lines. There's many elements of this that degrade well, um, and you'll learn more about how to degrade well with practice. So I definitely agree. It's 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 definitely not easier if you start with a cohort. Um, you know, five to ten is is pretty easy, and especially it gets it's helpful if you if you meet more than once. <laughs> you, uh, if you can start doing this sort of weekly or twice a week uh, at the beginning, and so you, you you will quickly develop a rhythm and kind of figure out what works. Um, and and these are some tips that will help, I think, lead you in the right direction and, and make things more productive faster. You know, learn learn from our experience. That's what we're here for. And one of these elements, and this is the last of the tips, is work what's within the room. I made the case earlier when uh, it's a, a accused squirrel of uh, bearing the lead, that the most important thing is you're doing this analysis to learn about yourself and your own skills. And so that means um, uh, you, you're not talking about people who are not present. You, you're not talking about uh, them, their uh, foibles, their mistakes, what they should have done differently. That, that's not practice. You know, I'm not saying you should never have those conversations. I'm just saying they're not part of a practice session. With the practice session, you're working with what's in the room. Now, I have done case studies with another person who was also part of the practice session. And we created what we call a three column case study. So we had the dialogue in the middle and one person's thoughts on one side and another person's thoughts on the other. In fact, we have an example in the book of one of those three column case studies. So you, you, um, you, if both people in the room, then you can talk about both perspectives. And that can be very insightful. 
um, but you're working with us in the room. The other thing is, in this applies to even your conversation with each other. It, it, there's a special irony of talking to someone and saying, you don't ask enough questions. I, I've, I've looked at this and you didn't say a single question. Did it ever, you know, did, it probably never occurred to you to ask a question. You, the only question you asked was a not genuine. Wasn't that right? To, and, and in Jeffrey, words, Jeffrey, can I just point out, in all that ranting that you just give, gave, you, you didn't ask any questions. Exactly. And you did ask one question. It was very leading question. Wasn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's true. So it's, 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 um, it's a special irony that we often will embody and enact the, the um, mistakes that we're trying to help someone else with while we're trying to help them. And I was assuming, I don't know if Jeffrey intended this, but I was kind of trying to illustrate how you could work with what was in the room. I, I, absolutely. That, 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 was, that, was, com that was completely, that was completely the, the point, which was uh, um, it, it's, it's very natural to fall in the habit. And so if you notice- And very helpful for someone to point it out. Exactly. It's very, in the practice session, you're working with that. You know, that's part of what you're doing. And it can be, actually, sometimes I found it really challenging. It, this was sometimes some of the hardest- work I did in a practice session was to think about how to provide feedback to someone that didn't buy like the feedback I was giving. Ah, oh, and, that, and that, that was, but that was great. That was what made it uh, such a powerful learning experience was trying to now apply the skills in real time. Because you have the case, which is either about a past conversation or a future one that you're worried about. But then suddenly now my thoughts are about what's actually happening right here. I'm trying to apply the skills in real time. That's, that's fantastic practice. But also so. very tiring. So expect to sleep well after, <laughs> after a session in which you're doing that. We have, we have another good question, which is, it came in earlier, but somehow I missed it. Um, uh, Jamie asks, do you run corporate sessions or are these techniques and how to use them explained in the book? Um, so the answer is briefly, yes, we do do corporate work. So you're very welcome to get in touch with us, conversationaltransformation.com again. Um, but uh, you don't need to do that because the techniques for analyzing conversations are in the book and um, you can download the conversation conversational dojo kit, which explains all the things we're saying today, plus the uh, recording so you can see how to, to do one of these. But if you'd like us to help you, that's something we can do for sure. So thanks, Jamie, right. for your question. Okay, so that's it for, for tips in the moment. Uh, we're now, we're in the home stretch. You know, we've, we've promised you that there's a run book, uh, that there's a, a dojo kit, here's, here's what's in it. So as I mentioned, uh, the, a lot of the material we already covered is, is outlined there. Uh, why, why have the, the, the dojo group? What are the types of sessions and tips and, and more tips than we actually uh, talked about? There's also a run book. And what I talk about uh, in, in that section there, it, it will give you um, the preparation. What are the steps that you will do before a session? So things to think about. Largely, this comes into kind of what kind of preparation is necessary. For and some it's structured of the, as a checklist, so you can just go through and check off each thing as you go through it. Right. So, so, so for some of the some of the um, sessions, it's more helpful to have uh, um, preparation. Now, for example, a full case analysis it helps if someone's brought a case. Now, I will say, if no one did, you can do them on the spot. We have absolutely done that before. So, if you if you all show up and no one brought the case, then you're I recommend you do it in the room. It uh, it's, it will not take that long. Um, so that's the kind of uh, the kind of things that are covered in the, in the run book. Um, similarly, in the dojo session it covers the kind of thing we talked about. For example, going around aha moments, um, and kind of gives you a, an overall flow. Uh, and then finally, there's some handouts. And um, there's the, the handouts we have uh, so far are the uh, the four R's, uh, which we've alluded to. And um, these are the flow through a conversation analysis. This is the record, reflect, revise, role play, repeat, and role reversal the six four R's, as a squirrel likes to say. Um, we also give a uh, example conversation. As you can see here, it's a two column format. It's one of the ones from the book. It's the one in chapter two. So what it covers there is that foundational scoring technique. It talks about um, finding the, the question fraction, uh, finding the number of uh, genuine questions on the right versus the number of total questions, and also on the left, underlining the things that were not shared. So highlighting lack of transparency. And I thought I might just really quickly score my conversation that I did um, live for you on the on the webinar, just for folks who haven't seen this, who, who are unfamiliar with it, and you can see how easy it is. Would that be okay, Jeffrey? Please. Cool. So um, let me read you my conversation. It says, uh, we have your services for as long as we need them. And I respond, yes, of course you do. And in my left-hand column, I think as follows, we have your services for as long as we need them. 
I can't stay forever. Uh, yes, of course you do. This is kind of aggressive. So uh, my left-hand column is revealing something that my right-hand column is not. And if I'm going to score this, um, I can score it very easily um, because I need to count the number of question marks. And if you were listening carefully, you noticed there were no question marks. So I score a zero out of zero. Um, that's the brief version. We can go into whether they're genuine or not if we have some, but I don't have any. So it's very easy to score. Um, and then uh, I can't stay forever. And uh, this is kind of aggressive are things I don't share in the right hand column at all. And I didn't go on in the rest of the conversation to say them either. Um, so you so under I also underline those things. Underline both of those. Um, so I have uh, underlines uh, on uh, my entire left hand side. So there I did, I just did the whole scoring. Now that's the reflect step. The revise step would be where I would go and actually change some of that. And I might try out with Jeffrey, that would be role playing, um, how I might have the dialogue in a different way. And that would be the, um, it, that's the, the kind of uh, the briefest version of a, of a conversational dojo that I can imagine um, <laughs> is write, write, the, write the case, uh, uh, score it, revise it, have the role play. Thanks very much. We're done. Yours yep. will probably be slightly longer because you'll have a <laughs> lot more conversation. You'll actually do it. Um, but that's the value. That's the learning uh, is from uh, taking the conversation and uh, analyzing it and improving it. And that's as simple as, uh, as it is to be. You can do much more complex things. And we talk about some of them in the book and in the kit, but um, that's the basics. Yeah. And, and the four hours are expanded on at length in the book. That's uh, chapter two. Um, the last thing in the hand of the handouts is there's a conversation scoring guide. And so we cover um, all of the scoring methods from the book in there. Um, of course, when we do other material, we come up with other scoring guides. So, um, for example, in the NBC workshop we did, we, we generated a new type of scoring that we used. Um, if, if you have any uh, questions about that, if you're trying to uh, adopt some sort of framework and you'd like some hints on um, this kind of scoring, get in touch. And I can tell you if it's one we've done before, and if not, it'd be fun to kind of invent one uh, with you. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so people, uh, just a reminder, that th th these, this is the book, uh, Agile Conversations. It's been out uh, now since May, uh, which has been fantastic to hear from so many people. Uh, I'm as getting authors. folded. I'm using it enough. Yeah. yeah. It's really gratifying to hear from people who've read it and who've been applying it. And I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be the case for, for some of you in the audience. And with that, uh, our promised final question slide. Here we go. So let's see if we can hit some of these questions. Yeah, and I'll just say this for anyone who, who uh, does not have a question, this is a chance for you to go to the chat again. And I, I, we have a question for you. Have you had any aha moments? Anything that you know, uh, stood out to you as uh, we went through this? So if you put your aha moments in the chat, we're looking forward to reading those later. Meanwhile, we'll answer the questions. That, uh, that sounds that good. And, and of course, we're modeling again something that you can do in your own dojo. We haven't tried to do a full dojo here. We thought about that. We thought it might be difficult to do a dojo with 124 people and um, uh, uh, you not so easily being able to speak to us um, and also in a limited time. But um, we've illustrated um, some of the characteristics, some of the things we recommended that you do. Hope that's helpful. Um, okay, so uh, these are questions that were more general or that for one reason or another I, I, I um, uh, didn't grab at the time. Um, I'll take one that I think might be uh, uh, easy for, for you, Jeffrey, because uh, follow on from something before I missed it. Vinod or Vinod says, um, did you divide the larger team, I guess he means the, the hundred uh, people, into smaller groups? And I think you didn't. I think you said you, you kept well, them all going together. They, they, were, they were all at, at, um, at separate tables. I can't remember if it was eight or 10 per table. Um, so they did have some of their conversations uh, where they were helping each other what were at the small table, but we did do ahas around the, the, the whole group of hundreds. So yeah, they were, there were breakouts in there. So that, that uh, was very helpful because the, the, the chance for everyone to contribute and, and, and chime in would be very difficult in the, in the, uh, if it was all hundred at once. So breaking it into small groups of eight to 10 made that manageable. Oh, okay. Got it. I misunderstood how you did it. We've got two questions, uh, both related to the same topic, except it keeps moving. Oh, darn. Uh, oh, okay. There's, yeah. Uh, have you found any significant differences in running a dojo in person versus remotely? Do you have experience with fully digital dojos? And there was one more that was similar to that, which seems to have disappeared. But there were, there were several questions about what's it like to do one remotely? And Jeffrey, I know you've been, been doing several that yeah, way because we've been all locked in our houses. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So even early on, our, our first judges together with Squirrel and I and a couple other people, those were, were in person. And then um, shortly after that, I started running them within my company. Now, the thing is, my company had remote developers who were among the keenest people to join these lunchtime sessions. So actually, I started doing remote sessions. We also had an office in Boston 
and uh, I was based in London. So we had remote sessions very early on. And one of the key elements that when we had this sort of partially virtual, like some people in the room and some people remote, um, we found it very helpful to have a shared Google Doc that we would use uh, for a case if we we're doing a full case analysis. So actually we, we moved to that rather than paper when we had this sort of mixed uh, room. So we could say this is the, this, we could, we're all looking at the same thing at the same time. So that was a, uh, that was a, a very helpful element when we were doing a full case analysis um, uh, in a distributed fashion. And since we've been doing things remotely, um, I'm uh, now have, have been doing things when I have these groups that are um, basically people don't know each other. Uh, uh, when, when it was within the work setting, people knew each other, they were a little bit more comfortable sharing the details of their cases. So they would actually share the dialogue that was happening in the workplace or in the home or, you know, with the neighbors. They were comfortable with the details. When I'm doing the groups that are purely public and people don't know each other, I, I don't have shared case material. I, people have their paper at home and then they may ask and share elements of it, you know, a line out of context. So we're not getting the whole dialogue. We're not, we don't need a, the background of all the drama. Uh, so people are able to keep the details private and that's still very effective, you know, because we can, we can ask about their framing in the conversation. What's their, their attitude, what's their feeling, what's their emotion around it and, and do some very valuable things. So all, all you really needed from my analysis was the phrase, um, uh, boy, that's really aggressive. And, and knowing it was in the left-hand column, something exactly. in my head and not something I shared. That was enough but, for you to definitely it, give me some feedback. Exactly. Uh, you might want to be sharing that piece of information that could be very valuable. Exactly. So a typical thing we might do in these cases, we might say, did anyone have any questions at all? <laughs> and, then, and then if, does anyone think that they had a genuine question? Usually a bunch of the hands are down. And then someone say, okay, what you think of a genuine question, is it something you can share with us? And, and so people have the chance to sort of opt in. And similarly, we might, when we do the, the underlining, did anyone have anything that they didn't share that they're not sure how they could share? And then so then people are able to, to opt into the level that they want to. So that's how we've handled the public sessions um, uh, remotely. Now, that sort of public public private divide, I've done that both virtually and in person. So the idea that you can keep your case private or share it is something that really applies in, in, in either setting. Great. Moving on to another question and related to Jeffrey's comments about uh, doing it within uh, the, the company he's in. Uh, do you recommend, this is from Chris, do you recommend that group sessions be held with folks inside or outside of your organization? Uh, either one works. The main yeah, thing- My that, answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> is <it> both. <laughs> and, and whether it's, I mean, one of the main elements is whether it's opt-in. The um, most important word in there is folks. I recommend you hold it with other people. That, yeah. you know, dogs are less likely to be helpful. Uh, fish, <laughs> definitely not. But people definitely can help. It um, doesn't matter whether they're inside or outside. And I would very, very commonly, we, we would hold an inside session on the same day that I would then hold a public session after hours. And that was kind of handy because I could, I could experiment with the in-company group saying, hey, how do we try this tool today? And that would help me run the public session uh, outside. So I, 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 think, I think both are good. I, I don't feel that one is necessarily better than the other. Um, it's just really, um, it's the most important part is having people who want to be there and want to practice the skills. What doesn't work is someone who um, is not interested in changing. Someone who thinks that they already master it and they're there just to show off their skills. You know, the, those, the, that's, that's problematic. Yeah, which leads in perfectly to uh, an anonymous person who asks, and, and by the way, I should say, we're at our official time, but I don't think Alex and Leah are going to boot us off. So we'll keep going. We'll try to get through all these questions. If you have more, please put them in. Um, we're having fun. We hope we're helping you. If you need to go, of course, go. You'll, you can catch us on the, on the recording later. Um, the anonymous person says, how do you get the group to buy into these types of discussion learning sessions? Uh, th that's great. And I, the good news is you do it through applying the principles that we talk about in the book, particularly joint design. And I, I was talking about someone about this uh, earlier today in a coaching session, and um, they were uh, describing a problem and, and using your favorite word, squirrel, my favorite, I mean, trigger word, convince. Uh, actually, what my trigger word was just. He said, I just need to explain. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> um, the, the way that you get people to buy in is, you, is, you, is you, in a sense, you don't. Really what you ask them is say, you, you, would, you would state your view. Say, I come across this conversational stuff. I, I, it seems like it'd be really interesting. I think it could really help us because I think we could be better at X, Y, and Z. 
I'm curious, what do you think? Do you think we have a problem or do you have any interest in, in trying it? Would, would be willing to run the experiment? That kind of approach to see if there's interest. Uh, because um, uh, I think approach that way, uh, uh, people may be receptive. If you come in and say, hey, I found this thing and I think we should start doing it and I want to book a practice session with no, no so the lack of questions there is more likely to get resistance. Um, so joint, joint design is the way to go. Sounds good. That's in chapter uh, five. Excellent. <laughs> um, another anonymous person asks, if you are not able to analyze the conversation with a group, are there books stroke checklists you would recommend that help you better analyze the conversation yourself, help you see your biases? Well, I, I can't imagine which book would be really helpful yeah. for that. <laughs> I think our, our publisher who's sponsoring this webinar would be unhappy if we didn't cite our own book, but uh, I'm sure we have uh, plenty of others that we can recommend as well. Um, and I'll put them in the chat if you uh, remind us what they are, Jeff. And I think the, the key thing is, is what helps you analyze your biases is that the key step is getting it on paper. Um, we, we've used this phrase self-distancing, and, and that's the idea of getting it out of your head. That is the number one most important element. If you, if you have trouble analyzing it when you first write it, put it in a drawer and come back to it the next day or the next week. The, the, the further you are separated in time from when you wrote it down, the more alien that person is and the easier it is for to use your tools on that person so i i, I think we, you know the the uh, what we outlined in the book that sort of that two column format is is really the the backbone and the, the key insight here is getting out of your head if you're doing that and then analyzing it that's the that's gonna be this the single biggest leap that you make there are other leaps that come later from from practice and other people can help you with because it will probably be patterns that you still continually have trouble with. But part of that is then over time continuing to practice and, and finding out where things go wrong, even though you think they should be going right. I'm, I'm practicing everything I've been, I'm not getting the results. I'm, I'm, I seem to be having these arguments and things are, are, are difficult, even though I'm doing it. What am I missing? And that might be a chance to get help from someone else if, if you can't get set, or you might get a, a moment of insight. And usually yeah, that's what happens. Person. There's some moment where you're like, oh, this is what I was missing. It usually hurts a lot. I think yeah. this person was also looking for other books that, um, that, they, that they might look at. Oh, um, I'm, I, might, I'm, I could start with, with just the Eight Behaviors for Smarter Teams, um, which is just a white paper you can download. The, the same author, uh, Richard Schwart, uh, Roger Schwartz, he also did. Um, he has a long extended version of that in a book form called um, Smart, uh, Smart Teams, Smarter Leaders, or maybe Reverse Smarter Leaders, Smart Leaders, Smarter Teams. I think that's that way. That's smart Leaders, good. Smarter Teams. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned difficult conversations. Someone's um, put that in the chat. So uh, uh, that's I, I also like authentic conversations. I like that quite a bit. Um, and also, if you have access to our book, then in our um, uh, appendix, in our, our footnotes, we, we give several of our references. I just found out today we're on uh, Google Books, so uh, don't tell the, the the publishers to stop listening. But you can you can go look up the uh, um, uh, index there. Uh, the, I'm pretty sure that the uh, uh, references are in there. So, but you, buy the book anyway because that'll help help the publisher. <laughs> I guess. Cool. A couple of others. Um, uh, Sam Samay Samay asks, uh, what are the typical norms that Conversation Dojo needs as as in order to be meaningful. I'm not quite sure I understand what Sammy means. Um, can you guess, Jeffrey? Sure, the, the, the norms to be meaningful. I, I, I think they're, they're um, one of the elements is, well, for any individual, you make it meaningful for yourself, it's just if you put the effort in. Right? If, you're, if, if you're doing the conversational analysis and no one else actually says anything, there's no <laughs> interaction, you at least will have done the work, you'll have at least done the analysis. So just your own, putting your effort in, I think that's the first thing. The second element comes around is, is being supportive of other people, which is you're there to help them with the skills, you know, to stay on the focus of the session as opposed to going off into other areas. So as an example, it can be very tempting uh, to talk about the other person who is, you know, not in the room because the other person in the conversation and say, oh, well, they clearly have these problems. That's, that's not practice. It can also be tempting to try to solve domain problems, right? That are in the dialogue. 
and, and, and it doesn't matter what the domain is. It could be a, a court case and you might say, oh, well, you know, the problem is you're citing the wrong precedent. <laughs> or, you know, if you're, it's, it, you know, if it's a technical issue, you might have a view on, you know, what testing framework they should be using. You shouldn't use Kubernetes for that. Yeah, don't do that. That's it, it, the kind exactly. of thing you don't, you want to be on, on point, not to, uh, it, it, exactly. to so I think that's non-conversational topic. Keep, keeping it to what are the skills we're practicing in the session and when you're practicing these conversational skills, it's not about, uh, the the subject of the conversation it's not about to me it's not about the other person uh, so th I think these are the main uh, um, tips I think to, to the sort of norms you need to have okay here's a related one from Jacob how how do you recommend using discussions to reveal the risk of quote the curse of knowledge close quote <laughs> well this is I mean this is perfect actually the, the kind of conversation analysis so people don't know curse of knowledge means that you I'm see I'm avoiding it right now I could have just gone on without without answering it. The, the curse of knowledge is when you assume that everyone else knows what you know. So, for example, I know that that's what the curse of knowledge is. So, I could have just answered it without explaining it. It's uh, it's the the act of doing these conversation analysis help you to identify things that you're saying that you're not explaining. So you uh, uh, you uh, as you analyze your conversations, you'll be like, you'll find errors, uh, the, the patterns of error. For me, one of the patterns of error was was saying obviously and moving on and not explaining the thing that it was obvious to me. Essentially, it was the curse of knowledge. And I, I learned as a as a as a as a um, habit, as a as a predefined, pre-planned habit, is if I ever find myself saying obviously to say it's not obvious and to explain it, just like what happened with the curse of knowledge. So that's that's how it worked for me. I've heard Jeffrey do this where he says, now obviously this is the way, now wait a minute, actually it's not obvious. Yeah. And that's that's a, a noticeable pattern for Jeffrey, which is and, very and, healthy. And for me, it, it very much came from the conversation analysis and it very much came from the group sessions uh, is where I, I developed that insight. Hard to pick them out if you don't have the, the group to help you. And last question, Sam, 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 Sam I'm, I'm murdering your name, I'm very sorry. Um, uh, given that Agile ceremonies are often misused, at, can an Agile dojo be an effective replacement? I wouldn't say you'd use <laughs> one of these as a replacement for an Agile ceremony, so something like a stand-up or a retrospective. I would say, though, that if you're uh, having poor retrospectives, for example, or if your planning games are, uh, are more like planning arguments, um, then a uh, dojo among the group um, uh, uh, practicing using these techniques could be very helpful. And that's, in fact, why we wrote the book, to help people with um, uh, their transformations, their attempts to adopt Agile or Lean or, or um, uh, DevOps practice practices that were going wrong and we were seeing it over and over again. We said, well, actually there are these tools and they're over here and they would help you and they'd help you more than adopting uh, this or that ceremony or, or timing your standups to be 7.23 uh, microseconds long or uh, whatever the, the latest advice is, which I can never keep track of. Um, so uh, I advise that um, a conversational dojo could help you address the problems of your ceremonies. I don't think it could replace one. And, and to be clear, all of the ceremonies exist to trigger conversations. All of the ceremonies are there for conversations. That's why they exist. When the ceremony isn't working, it's because the conversation isn't working. You hold the dojo to have the skills to be successful with your ceremony because the point of the ceremony is the conversation. Great, and we have a late question, which isn't really a question, but we'll end on this lighthearted <laughs> note. Apparently, Jeffrey looks like Colin Mockery, an improv comedic act actor. I have no <laughs> idea who that is, but um, I enjoy being part of a double act with Jeffrey, so that's uh, very pleasurable. So, well, when, uh, when we were in Las Vegas, we were, said we looked like um, Penn and Teller, right? When we were on stage together. Yeah, well, together. the size, yes. What you can't see here is Jeffrey's <laughs> a lot taller than me. Um, I'm nothing as good, and I do actually talk, unlike Teller. Anyway, um, so we'd love to hear from you at conversationaltransformation.com. If you have more questions, if you have more discussion, um, if you're trying to apply this and it doesn't work, uh, we have a Slack channel you can join there. We have uh, free material you can pick up, videos, other things. You can get in touch with us. Somebody wanted to uh, have us uh, come do corporate work. We're very happy to do that. We're both consultants. And so our podcast is available. Oh, of course, Troubleshooting Agile, which we have 132 episodes. So if, you, if you're bored and you want to listen to a, a lot more of us. <laughs> There's a hundred and, you know, uh, something like a hundred hours of us. So um, you can, you can go and listen to your heart's content. So all that's available. Um, uh, would enjoy uh, hearing from you. And of course, uh, please buy Agile Conversations to make our publisher and us happy. <laughs> Excellent. I think we'll stop there. Alex, any final comments or should we just close there? No, you're great.
close it out. That was amazing. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, look, everyone. Forward, look forward to seeing your aha moments in the chat. Absolutely. We'll be reading those. Thanks. And we'll send the recording and Dojo kit via email. Yes, of course. Take care, everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye.